I'm so glad you've joined us today on our quest to discover how God is infinitely more loving than we ever imagined. If you haven't already, please go to our website, thebiblelab.com, and download a free copy of study guide number seven of our series, Acts of God, that everyone in our studio audience is walking through as well. You've probably been waiting for this episode because it answers one of mankind's most pressing questions. Why do you think there are storms and shipwrecks in our lives? God who controls the winds and waves could certainly have spared Paul and all of us these awful experiences. Why do you think he does not? What you are about to discover might just change your perspective on this forever. Welcome to the Bible Lab. Take out your yes, no, and maybe cards. I'm gonna read five statements. If you agree with the crazy statement, raise a yes card. If you disagree with the statement, raise a no card. And if you just can't possibly commit, you can raise a purple maybe card. Sound good? Awesome, let's do it. Number one, I am less afraid of death than the people sitting around me. Uh, let's see this, look at these brave people. I am less afraid of death than the people sitting around me. Oh, look at this, what a courageous crowd. I am seeing about 60% yes and about 20% no, which means these 20% maybes. Is that maybe because you don't know if the person next to you is afraid of death? Or is it, uh, what well, depends on what kind of death? Is this like a painful death? Or is this like a quick painless death, right? I don't know either. Number two, I think people who become afraid during thunderstorms are silly. Ah, look at all these people afraid of thunderstorms. Oh, this is great. We got about half the crowd here, maybe more than half, that are, they're very brave in the Bible lab because they're willing to say they're afraid of thunderstorms, but more than half of you are afraid during thunderstorms. Wow. Oh, that's not what I asked? Yeah, so if you said no, you don't think they're silly, which means you're afraid. It's a triple negative. Yes, you'll understand. I'll explain it later. Number three. Uh, number three, Pastor Ice is always correct. Yes or no? No. I didn't even get one maybe card on that. Thank you, Chris, you're going to heaven. Great. Number three, the real number three. God only intervenes and stops our trials when they will cause us to give up on him. He only intervenes and stops our trials when it will cause us to give up on him. Okay, I'm seeing predominantly no, almost all no. I see a couple of maybes, I see a yes, I see a couple of yeses, but mostly, it looks like 98, 99% no. So what you're saying is, God does intervene and suffer trials, even at times that will not cause us to give up on, to give up on him. It's, it's a quadruple negative? <laughs> Thank you, Byron. Which means, some of you are looking at this and saying, look, God intervenes um, at times even when it won't affect whether we fall away from him or not. Um, he'll intervene just because he doesn't want you to go through whatever that trial is. And I've preached it, I've heard a lot of people preach it, we're gonna have a challenge today. Because what we see in, in today's study is that there's a lot of times that God could stop the storm. And you got some mature faith and so you know he can stop the storm and he doesn't stop the storm despite how hard you've prayed and how long you've prayed. He does not stop the storm. And it causes uh, this cognitive dissonance. It causes quite a challenge for some people to say, I believe God can, I believe God loves me, but does he love me enough to get me out of the pain that I'm in right now? Because the pain right now is unbearable. And I'm not gonna give up on him, but I need him to stop the storm. And he doesn't. And it 
causes us to stop and ask the question, so what's this say about God? Does he really love you? Does he really care? Because the storm's still going on. I'm still hurting. I'm still painful. I'm trying to remain faithful, but I'm hanging on to the top of the skyscraper with my fingers, and it's slipping. And I I feel like I'm about to fall. And yet God is still not stopping the storm. It's a big question that we have to wrestle with today. Number four, God only protects us from trials until we are spiritually mature. God only protects us from trials until we are spiritually mature. Once again, a sea of no's. A sea of no's. We're going to talk about this today. Because ultimately, the question that we have is, do the trials come to help us become more mature? Or do the trials only come when God knows we're mature enough to handle the trials? Or is it both? It's a good good question we're going to have to deal with today. And number five, God is more goal-oriented than he is process-oriented. Oh, this is the groaner. Good, okay. This is the groaner. We are all over the place. We are all over the place with this, which means we don't know. (laughs) Yes. Or perhaps we just voted based on how we are. If you're more goal-oriented, you said, yeah, God's more goal-oriented. He made me this way. He's obviously this way. And the process-oriented people said that, and the rest that you're like, I I have no idea whether I'm process or goal-oriented. I'm just happy to have gotten a seat today. You raised the maybe card. Yes, exactly. We have a huge discussion today. We're taking a look at some of the last pictures, the, the stories that we have from the book of Acts. We're in chapter 27 today. And as we begin to get to the end of this book, there's a very interesting story that many of us have read through really quickly. Some of us have never read at all. And it's toward the end of the story, which makes us think it's toward the end of Paul's ministry. There's some debate about this. We can talk about this later. But you would think that by this time, you know, in all stories, uh, you go through the challenge, you go through the challenge, and then you get to the place to where good versus evil, and then good triumphs and evil is totally uh, kicked out of the scene, and they lived happily ever after. But God's story is not always that way. It doesn't follow this typical storyline. And we find ourselves in a storm. We know what a storm is like, don't we? I think we got a quarter of an inch of rain this week, didn't we? <laughs> Whew! You hear the news, you think we're all going to drown. <laughs> Stormwatch 2019. So we know what storms are about, okay? Some of us even have a little thunder. And so we find ourselves in a storm. But before we get there, to get and make sure all of us are on the same page, I want to ask us a question. And if you, didn't, if you don't mind, just help us, uh, help us picture this in our minds by answering this question. What's the worst storm you've ever experienced? Did you feel like you were facing possible death? And if so, what was your view of God at that time? Okay. Now, storm, perhaps I should have put quotation marks around it because it doesn't have to actually be rain storm. It could be a storm in your life. Uh, Did you experience a a stormy time in your life and you really thought, I'm just not going to make it through it? And what was your picture of God during that time? We're going to start with Jack over here. Yeah. Well, I uh, was living in Safford, Arizona. I owned a Piper 185 with retractable gear. Airplane. Airplane. That's correct. That's correct. I uh, had gone t- to fly to Las Vegas for my younger sister's graduation. Mm-hmm. All went well there. On the way home, I checked the uh, weather, and it was in aviation terms, CAVU, clear and visibility unlimited. Mm-hmm. As I got very close to Prescott, Arizona, the whole sky fell in on me. I was in a massive hailstorm, and uh, it was just pounding on my wings in the windshield, and I thought, this is the end. 
Suddenly there was a clearing over Prescott, Arizona where they have a large, nice landing field because they have an aviation training program there mm -hmm. for pilots in training. And I thought that my days were over, but I was able to land and get the gear down. I didn't have to land with the gear up. And um, I spent three hours on the ground until that cleared. Amen. God was truly with me. Yeah. So you say God was truly with you. You felt that when you got on the ground. <laughs> Affirmative on that one. So can I, uh, we're, we're close enough friends that I could probably ask a follow-up question. During the process of, you're in a hailstorm, you're in the air in a Piper Cub, which is not a large Not a air, Piper Cub. I'm sorry? A Piper 180, that's a much larger plane than a Piper Cub. Okay. How many seats? Four. Okay, so <laughs> it's huge. It's massive. Thank you for clarifying, because everyone would have gotten the wrong I'm glad picture. my wife wasn't with me. Uh, during the process, what, okay, you believed in God. What, did that make a difference while you're in, there, in the airplane? Did it not? Did you think what's going to happen is going to happen? What were your thoughts during the storm? Afterwards, you know, I was telling of all the blessings that I received in that occurrence. Mm -hmm. And that has guided my life and future problems that I've gotten myself into. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. It's, it's interesting, you know, your experience in, the, in an airplane. Um, when I was at Pacific Union College, and some of you are related to the experience, uh, I was at Pacific Union College, there was an airplane uh, crash. The wings, wings had iced over, and uh, a couple of families killed, uh, you know, uh, the, the parents, the kids, um, in a single crash. Um, and the people there wished, at the memorial service, the people wished that they had the testimony to say, and when they landed on the ground, they all were, thank God, we made it. What do you do in the midst of a storm when you don't know whether your story will end up like Jack's or another story, which is you just don't make it? And the reality is during the storm, you don't know which ending is going to be written and whether you're going to land safely or whether you're not. Um, what does it say about the character of God that some people land safely and some don't? It's hard. It's the real question. All right, I see a red microphone over here. Yes, a black microphone first. I'm sorry, go ahead. More than uh, about 57 years ago, we had flown to Hong Kong for just a break because we were in Borneo and there's not much, there wasn't much going on there then. And we got on the plane, and in Hong Kong, the runway's clear out in the ocean. We took off, and I looked out the window, and the engine was on fire. And I elbowed my <coughs> husband, and I said, are we, what's gonna happen? Well, they turned the plane around, we landed, and we had to sit there till they fixed that plane it was only one plane going to Borneo a week. We got, as we were turning around and landing, there was a nun sitting next to me and she was working her beads and I thought, Lord, if you don't hear me, I hope you hear her. <laughs> <laughs> I got a few loving cards on that one. Well, what amazes me about this whole story is you stayed on that plane. We had no... We you had, got on that same plane again. We had no choice. We had to get back. Oh, you had a choice. Yeah. Well, we didn't think so. Uh, well, someday, well, God, I guess this is where I'm supposed to settle. Um, yes, I will look for a home. Yeah. That was back in the days when we were just married. And... Our trip over there was my first really big trip on an airplane. <laughs> so you have to know, I was worse than a nervous Nellie. I, uh, I remember hearing uh, someone say uh, years ago, 
about how airplanes actually get off the ground. And they wrote this little uh, prose that said, um, it, this whole thing about the wind going over one side of the wing faster than the other, that's just mumbo jumbo, that's nonsense. What actually gets airplanes off the ground is the collective nervousness of the people <laughs> on the plane. Because they grab the armrest and collectively, as you're going faster and faster, they pull up on those armrests, which literally lifts the plane <laughs> off the ground. And the reason why there's so many more airline wrecks today oh. is because people are less nervous to fly. <laughs> and not as many people are pulling up on those armrests. So, All right, do I have a mic over here? Yeah, blue mic. Um, my storm is still going on. Yeah. Uh, I have a almost 24-year-old son that's handicapped. And when we realized, uh, when he was diagnosed at 17 months, we knew we'd never be able to live through it. it. You know, why do bad things happen to good people was just everything we thought of. Mm. And through the years, there's there's been really difficult times, but we see how God has stayed with us yeah. and and kept us buoyed by the, the love of friends and family. Now I feel that that storm is more of a puddle jumper because I have a 13-year-old boy, and that storm <laughs> is just <laughs> raging all over the place. <laughs> but um, I think the main thing is that we feel him close to us, and it's not just his spirit, but his spirit through friends yeah. that keep us. Yeah, but that's legitimate. I mean, your story is, this is not the story that you had written in your mind as far as what it would be like to be a mom, to have a family, uh, to have these challenges that you never dreamt of, and that you probably, if you're like most people, you prayed that you wouldn't have to experience. And yet, the storm's still there. And, uh, and unfortunately, a storm is not a quick storm. It's a multi-year long storm. And so that is the experience of a lot of people in life that say, look, I hear the preacher say on TV, that if I just give my heart to Christ, everything gets better. That God comes in and now everything's happy. Now all your finances are taken care of. Now all your relationships are taken care of. I did that. I gave my heart to Christ. And man, the storm got worse. What, what do you do when the storm gets worse? Exactly. Red microphone over here. Around 16 years ago, I was in my early 40s, and I was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I was a stage three. And to me, that has to be the worst storm I've been through. Um, you, it, it's a long storm. It isn't something that happens within a few, obviously, a few minutes or days. Um, yet, during that time, obviously, I thought, you know, why did God allow this to happen? That did go through my mind. Yeah. But I often felt that there's sin in this world and it comes to all of us. Mm -hmm. I didn't think God was putting that on me or wanted me to get stronger spiritually or grow or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I was blessed, I'm still here. But at the time it is difficult when you're going through it. But yeah. to me, I'll tell you, I prayed more during you know the, the treatments of chemo, radiation, surgery, et cetera. I prayed more during that time than probably the rest of my life put together. Yeah. So in that aspect, it was you know, a blessing to me. God was able to bring good out of that. Yes, it's yeah. still hard though when you go through it. There's yeah. no way around it. Absolutely. When I was a student pastor in Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, yeehaw, um, <laughs> student pastor, I know nothing. I mean, literally nothing. And um, I just switched over uh, to theology as, as a major, and so I really knew nothing. And uh, so I'm doing my best, and everyone had advice for me. Uh, I had worked as a full-time pastor many years later. Eight years into ministry was the first time someone asked me for advice, which blew me away. I was speechless, because all these years when people would come up to me, I would cringe, because I knew they had some advice for me. Um, 
<laughs> but no one asked for my advice until eight years into ministry. So, of course, everyone had advice. So one, uh, one week, out in the foyer, this man came up to me, a beautiful man, godly man, and he says, I have prayer requests for you, uh, Pastor Roy. Will, will you pray for this? I said, I'll pray for anything. And he says, I need you to pray that God will bless this nation so much in finances, in relationships, in every way that God will bless this land so much that people will then recognize God and turn to God. Will you pray for that? And it was the first time in pastoral ministry that I had to tell someone I would not do what they asked me to do. And I said, I can't pray for that, but I will pray for the last part, that people will turn to God. But if people are to turn to God, I think we need to pray that the nation get poorer and have harder times and more strife and people be unhappy so that they'll realize they need something they don't currently have mm -hmm. and then turn to God. And he goes, oh, no, Pastor, don't pray that prayer. And uh, it's hard to go through the storm, but what you said is absolutely true. It's during the hard times that we turn to God. It's during the hard times that we pray like we've never prayed before. And so although the storms are hard, those of us that recognize that the storm is an opportunity to pray hard, it really is beneficial to our relationship with God because when things are going really well, we tend to tell God, it's all right, I got this. I, got, I don't need you yet. I'll let you know when I need you. And then our relationship has drift uh, away from God. Last comment over here before we go through the filter of scripture. Actually, a two-part story, just very quickly. Number one is, was in about 1975. We were driving from Tennessee, finishing the adoption of our oldest son, coming across near Ocotillo Wells. I believe it was on, on the 8 highway coming across. And we, we passed massive rain. A Brinks truck in the middle of the highway dumped out all of its contents four police cars with rifles sticking out. You could hardly see it because it was so bad in the rain. Pulled off at Ocotillo Wells to get something to eat and relax. And then we were told, I was on the CB radio I had in the car, this was 75, that there was a massive water, wall of water coming down the hill. My wife and I were scared. We didn't understand the desert. We didn't know anything about this kind of stuff. So we drove to the highest part we could find and she agreed she would try to swim, which she couldn't and I was to take the sun and try to head for the hills right off the expressway. There was a 500-year bridge, supposedly, that was taken out at that time because of that. We watched houses explode as this 40, 50-foot wall of water came down the hill. We were petrified. The people at the hospital knew when I was in San Diego, we were coming here for the weekend, that we were driving a white car, and the story was there's a white car on the bridge when it collapsed, so everybody was having a prayer session for us. We got to finally where we could go across the Salton Sea, and the police made me push a car ahead of me and go down into the water and come out very fast. He jumped on my hood and hung on and said, well, so we got out of that. We learned a lot about faith and prayer. It was a chance to recover because the son we were adopting is a very interesting story in the entering and very quickly. We were called late at night. Would you like to have a new baby? He's 18 months old. We said yes. Now, you can't adopt for three months because the girl isn't 18 and she wants to do the signing off. At four months, we called and said, what's the story? That baby's not up for adoption. What are you talking about? Yeah. We taught him to pray. We bought the everything. Everything was ours at the house. We were devastated because we knew he was going back into a drug arena. Yeah. And I could not accept a God who would put a God. So I spent Sabbath in Atlanta not being an Adventist. And I spent the next week. And we were leaders in the College Dale Church at that time as young people. Finally, on Friday night, this is almost three weeks, I said, okay, I guess I have to accept that God knows something I don't know. I'm a little stupid. So therefore, on Sabbath morning, the phone rang at the College Dale Church. And they came and found me and said, there's a phone call. Would you please come get it? The lady on the other end of the line says, do you want your son back? He's yours. Come get him. And that was the story. Sometimes we're led through those experiences to teach us we need to have faith at all cost. Wow. Wow, that's huge. Thank you so much. By the way, we found out 35 years later when he was 35, he was stolen. We could write a volume, uh, several volume set of stories in this room, couldn't we?
You've heard of all these storms, literal and figurative. Times when people felt like, am I going to make it? Am I not going to make it? This last story, just the roller coaster. All of you, and especially some of you who have adopted children before, you know firsthand, you empathize with what a roller coaster it is. Are we going to get them or are we not? Are we, yes, we are. No, we're not. Oh, everything's perfect. Now everything's not. Back and forth. And the, the stories in this room would, would echo in many ways the, the story that you just heard. What do you do when life is not this trajectory of getting closer, closer, closer to God and life getting easier and better and more successful? What do you do when it feels like it, it goes from bad to worse to, oh, there's something even worse than that? Okay, great. What do you do in those situations? And I want you to have that emotion in your heart because you have to know Paul and Luke and, and the individuals at this time of this story have to be asking the question. God, we're doing everything that you want us to do, despite the fact that we're being persecuted for trying to represent the true Messiah. Um, things aren't going well. In fact, it seems like some of the places we go to and we have some success, uh, the enemy sends people right behind us and confuses people, and it's worse than square one. It gets to the place to where Paul has been literally going from town to town trying to set up churches and and people come behind him and undercut everything that he's done and as you read through acts from where we just left to where we are now in chapter 27 it's this back and forth and finally he says you know what i'm gonna go to jerusalem everyone tells him don't go to jerusalem so he says okay i'll go to jerusalem um they say they're gonna kill you there he says Okay, I think I'll go to Jerusalem. A prophet of God comes up to him, takes Paul's belt off. Now, obviously, it's a different culture. If someone took your belt off today, you'd be like, dude, uh, <laughs> back off. Um, takes Paul's belt and then ties up his hands, his, his wrists, and ties up his feet and says, this is how God showed me that you will leave Jerusalem. You're going to be arrested. So Paul says, cool. Can I have my belt back? I'm going to Jerusalem. Um, and he puts his belt on and he goes to Jerusalem. He goes there and ultimately, and depending on which commentary you read, uh, of course, the uh, more or orthodox uh, Jews there can't stand him. So they're looking for ways to, uh, to undercut his authority. But if you read some commentaries, they actually say there were people even amongst the way, the Christian movement, that they didn't like what Paul was doing because he was inviting Gentiles to be part of the Jewish Messiah movement known as the Way. And because of that, even members within the church trumped up charges that he brought a Gentile into the Jewish temple. And it's the same today. Even though we're people of faith, we try to come together and grow together. We don't always see eye to eye. And because of different methodologies, sometimes we shoot our own. And many commentators say this in order for them to have been able to have the access and the information that, that had to be corroborated, chances are there were some people on the inside as well. And so he's arrested and he's, uh, he's taken to Caesarea where he pleads his case. And all of these Jewish officials come in and try to have him executed. Well, the authorities there say, okay, this is great, but I, I don't understand why this is a death penalty charge. And because it went back and forth, uh, finally, uh, Paul ends up in jail for two years until that leader leaves and a new leader comes in. New leader says, hey, what's this prisoner all about? He's going through the list of who's in jail for what. And we get to Paul, the guy's like, I don't know. It's, it's, they're upset about something. I can't figure it out. I don't understand. It's a church matter. And so he brings Paul out and he says, uh, what, what's this all about? Paul says, while the people who are accusing him and saying that he needs to be killed, uh, Paul realizes that he's about to lose. And so he pulls his Roman citizen card out. He says, I want to appeal before Caesar in Rome. That's my right as a citizen. You can't kill me here in Caesarea. Uh, you got to take me to Rome because I'm going to tell Caesar exactly why I'm here. And that basically closes the case. And now 
he has to be taken to Rome to get a fair hearing as a Roman citizen. And so, ultimately, we pick up the story right here at this place. Acts chapter 27, we're going to start uh, looking from verse 9 all the way through verse 44. So I apologize, it's a bit long, but I'm going to get through it really quickly, and then we're going to talk about it. Verse 9, Acts 27 says, Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So what's going on? Basically, a centurion has been charged with taking Paul all the way to Rome. So he rents passage on a ship. It's a professional ship. It's not a Roman vessel. In fact, many people think it's an Egyptian boat. And he gets on this boat along with Paul, and then because it's, an, it's a ship owned by someone else, it's a private ship, other people can buy a ticket to ride on the ship. So the centurion has a couple of prisoners, and then the rest of the people either are working for the ship or are uh, passengers that say, well, we want to go too. And so what we find here with the we language is that Luke bought a ticket too. So even though Paul's going as a prisoner, Luke goes as a non-prisoner. So said, much of the time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. What does that mean? It means it's probably late September, early October. The date, much like uh, some of our holidays, like Thanksgiving, you know, falls on a Thursday. And so it's a different date each year, but it's around the same time. So this is a very dangerous time to sail. Uh, people were still sailing, but it's dangerous. It's kind of like in the Caribbean here. You know, November is probably not a good time to be on a cruise in the Caribbean because there's a high chance of a hurricane, right? What's well, the same in this part of the world. Late September through October is a bad time. By mid-November, nobody sails until February. And so it's kind of this danger zone, but if you got to sail, well, you better get it done before the end of October. And so that's why they bring up the Day of Atonement, because it's somewhere late September, early October, and it's still a very dangerous time to sail because of the storms. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo into our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of a hurricane force called a, nor a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis. And uh, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. I told you so. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. You hear the captain saying, what, what? Last night, an angel of, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. 
for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. Short time later, they took soundings and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, we sail, uh, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. They threw the grain into the sea basically because this is a grain vessel. That's how they were able to make bread. And it was a common practice for these coastal ships to transport grain uh, throughout the Roman Empire. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that, that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Brings up a lot of questions, doesn't it? There's a storm. Paul is heading to Rome. First of all, why do you think that there are storms and shipwrecks in our lives? God, who controls the wind and waves, could certainly have spared Paul and us these awful experiences. Why do you think he does not? Why do you think God does not spare us the storms and the shipwrecks? We'll start here with you, Sandy. Thank you. Well, I think, I think there is a very good verse in the Bible that helps at least answer partially the why question. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, 2 Corinthians 1.4 mm -hmm. that says, you will comfort others who have been through what you have been through. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us in the room have probably been on both sides of that equation where someone else has gone through a trial yeah. that we've gone through the exact same thing. And I've had that happen. And a person later told me, you saved my life wow. by doing that. And so you know, we go through things, but then we can use that to, to comfort others. Others can comfort us when we've yeah. gone through that. Yeah, it's true. If not for going through some of these experiences, we truly can only be sympathetic. Yeah. Um, but empathy has a way of communicating deeper and the relationship being richer and, and more connected. If you can tell someone, yeah, I know exactly what you went through. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Raul. This story reminds me of two other stories in the Bible. One is um, Abraham pleading for the life of people living in so Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, and the other story is Esther pleading for the lives, Queen Esther yeah. pleading for the 
lives of the Jews in yeah. the city of Susa. And uh, it makes me wonder how often God spares the lives of people around us because there is a faithful Christian in there, mm -hmm. or two or three. Yeah, that's a great point. It reminds me of a third story as well, Jonah. It's another storm, but here's the interesting thing. God saves the lives of the crew of the ship when the believer gets off the ship. Sometimes it's better for the believer to not be around. <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed and didn't say amen. Because um, that's the hard thing. It's because there are times that God needs us on the ship through the storm, and there's other times that God says, I brought the storm because you're on the ship. Are you on the ship to get to where God wants you to go, or are you on the ship because you're not going the way God wants you to go? And that seems to be the difference in the Paul story and the Jonah story is the storm comes and Paul is on the ship going where he needs to go. The storm comes and Jonah is on the ship going where he doesn't need to go. And yet God uses both of those storms to enact his will. It's a very interesting twist there. You have a question there, yeah. Actually, uh, whatever the thing is. <laughs> I, there's a story in uh, the beginning of World War II that... Uh, people were trying to escape from a the uh, different countries in Asia that were threatened by the Japanese uh, invasions and so forth. And uh, the story goes that a man went to a shipping company and said, are there any Adventists leaving on this ship to get out of whatever country it was? He said, and he was told yes. He says, then I want to be booked on that ship to wow. buy a ticket. Wow, okay, so that's the opposite of what I expected that story to end. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we haven't always made the best of friends uh, outside, and so it's great, great to know there's someone out there that had an experience that they said, I need, I need a person of faith. We see that in Bible characters throughout the Old and the New Testament, where uh, individuals realize that there's something about the God that you serve. And if that relationship is real, God is there. God wants to protect you. But the question is, is he protecting you because you're immature? Or is he protecting you because you're mature enough to handle it? And it brings us to a point. If, if you don't mind, let's reread a couple of verses here. Verses 21 to 26 to make sure we take a look at this. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have been spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage. Now, the typical Greek story that the people had heard that were right there on the ship, the typical Greek story at this point of the story is when the main character is supposed to stand up and say, okay, everybody, all hope is lost. We need to abandon ship. This is the classic point in the story when the person stands up and says, there's no way out of this. And then in the story, something happens and somehow they get out of it. So Paul stands up and does the opposite of what everyone on that ship expected. He stood up and said, ah, don't worry about it. Take courage. We'll be all right. Why? He said, uh, now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. A couple of things here. Paul says, the God whom I belong and believe. Okay? There's, there's two things there. You can believe in God and not belong to God. And it's not God choosing to accept you and make you belong to him. It's you choosing who you belong to. Even the Jesus said that even, even the devil believes in Scripture and believes in God. So you can believe in God and not belong to God. And so Paul clarifies here. The reason why I know 
that I'm going to make it through the storm and you all will make it through the storm is because I belong to God. Sometimes. Because we have stories all throughout the Bible when Jesus is, calms the storm, right? There are times when Jesus calms the storm. But most of the time, he does not. At times when he doesn't calm the storm, God chooses to calm you. And that's what Paul is saying here. God's not going to calm the storm. Take courage. Be calm. Because God is going to calm you. And you're going to go through an experience of riding through the storm to realize that the God I belong to and believe in is real. Because I'm going to tell you something before it happens. Don't you know that every man, woman, and child on that ship believed in God after that experience because it happened exactly the way Paul said it would happen? So sometimes the storm isn't even about you. Sometimes the storm is about the men, women, and children around you. Because if God can help calm you and calm them through the storm, don't you know that they have a different perspective of God after the storm than they had before the storm? So it's not necessarily about you. Sometimes it's about the people who are in the ship with you. Several years ago, my wife and I, our, our kids were really small. In fact, uh, Colton, our youngest, uh, I believe he was just barely over a year and a month old. Uh, and Riley at that time was, was around five. We went on a mission trip which it was the second time I had done it. The first time I had no idea how this would work. It was called Cruise with a Mission, which is you go on a cruise ship and at each port of call you do missionary work. I thought, well, that, that sounds like a contradictory idea. Hey, let's live in lavish luxury and then go help the people on the poor islands that we stop at. But I didn't realize how amazing it was until I experienced it about how you would fuel up as much as you could on the ship so that when you went to those ports of call and you served, you expended all that fuel. You gave people more than you could on a regular mission trip because you had more energy and you had the ability to do it. So this is the second year we were doing it. We get on the ship. It's the very first night. We're just barely getting out of, uh, out of the bay in, uh, in Florida near Tampa Bay, and a storm comes up, and it is a big storm. When the climax of the storm comes, we are, we are dining. My wife's across the table from me. Colton uh, was in a little high chair. Riley's sitting next to me here. We're trying to eat, but the ship begins to list quite a bit, and the waves, huge waves, begin to hit the ship, and it's hitting on the side. They're trying to get the pilot uh, that got us out of the bay back onto the pilot boat to go back uh, to Tampa Bay, and so they can't turn the ship into the waves. And so while this is happening, and we're in the dining room, the waves just keep hitting and it gets worse and worse and the ship is tilting more and more and you start hearing dishes crashing off of the prep areas. They have Christmas trees in this beautiful dining room. Christmas trees are falling over. Decorations are falling. It's it's not a good place to be. And so about that time I ask for Colton and I I take him in my arms. He's, he's there. The tables are bolted down to the floor, but the chairs are loose. And so I'm trying to figure out, Riley's here. We're leaning away. How, how can I make sure our, our kids are safe? And about that time, a rogue wave comes along, and it hits the broadside of that ship. Now, mind you, the winds are at 65 knots, so it's already listing the ship. And this rogue wave hits it on the worst side. And all of a sudden you hear the ship groan and crashing of all kinds of plates and everything falling over as as quick as you can imagine. The ship begins to turn over. We see the, the high chair that Colton had been in just minutes before vanish as it sped away and everything on our plate it was like a, a, a beginner magician who didn't know how to do the the pull the tablecloth trick. Everything from every table off your table quicker than you can blink. At that moment, the ship continued to list and tilt, and I heard the groaning, and I sat across the table, here we go. I just knew it was Poseidon Adventure Part 2 about to happen. (laughs) And I was trying to remember how to get out of the ship upside down. It listed so far, I'm literally, have my foot on the, uh, on the, uh, 
the thing bolted into the floor for the table. Riley's against me. The, the chairs behind us slide backwards and slam in, in, into our table with people in them. And uh, I just knew we were going over. What do you do in a moment like that when you know this is not the trip we planned? We're here for a mission trip, and here everything seems to be ruined. $50,000 just of dishes were ruined in that rogue wave experience. The ship was a mess. As we tried to get out of the dining room, it's listing so much that it's very hard to walk, much less you can't even see the carpet. It's just covered with debris. We walk into the hallway and the corner is at such an angle that the corner between the wall and the floor, the crew and, and us are walking along the crease of the corner because that's the only place you could walk to get to your room. We get down there and, and the wind is still blowing, the storm is still here and everyone is freaking out. Even the crew is seasick. This is how bad it is. Throughout that night, it was uh, not a very restful night. <laughs> as you can imagine. We get to the end, and we all gather together, about 120 of us on this cruise with the mission. We gather into this ballroom that we're meeting in, and we say, what do, what do we do? And there were people who were upset, because as we found out that morning, we were not going to be able to serve at that port of call. We were not even able to get off the ship, so the whole reason why we're there, we're not able to get off the ship. The second morning, we find out we're not able to stop in Jamaica and go and serve there. And some people started getting really agitated and really angry. It was at that moment that a brilliant leader said, uh, you know what, there's still a mission to be done. And there's still people on this ship that need to be served. What could we do on the ship to help? There's a lot of things that need to be done. There's a lot of things that have been damaged and wrecked on this ship why don't we look and see if we can be missionaries on the ship? And for that whole week, we couldn't get off uh, at a port of call until the very last day. And that whole week, God opened up opportunities for us to serve on that ship, cleaning up, helping, uh, for example, in the library. The librarian was supposed to uh, end at the end of this week and, and, and leave the ship and hadn't done the proper inventory. So several of us went down and inventoried the entire library, which actually was fairly extensive, and did all of months and months and months of work in a couple of days. Uh, we helped the chefs. Uh, they were going to create these beautiful gingerbread uh, houses and, and do a scene for the people. It's supposed to be a, a special time around Christmas time. And we said, can we help you? What parts can we do? And helped him because he was so busy trying to fix all of the other things. They lost so much food, so many plates and everything. And we looked for all the different ways in the Children's Center to say, how can we in the Children's Center help you? You've got kids coming for Christmas break. Can we cut out the crafts for you and get it all ready? It turned out to be the most incredible mission we've ever experienced because on that ship, the people on the ship that went through the storm looked at us and said, for the first time, we have people on the ship that say, how can we serve you? What is this all about? The question that we have to ask is as we go through the stormy times, is it about us surviving or is it about us serving? Is it an opportunity for us to show the character of God or is it a chance for us to show how upset we are that the storm came into our life and this was supposed to be an incredible time? The character of God says, look, the most important thing to me is as many of you as possible live with me forever and always. And so sometimes I can't turn off the storm. Because if I turn off the storm now, you will never have the opportunity to affect the people around you to truly see the character of God and that God actually does care. So if we ask for him to turn off the storm, sometimes we're also asking God to turn off the opportunity. And we can't do that. Because God is love, and he says, I need every opportunity possible to show all the people around you that it doesn't matter the storm that's happening. It matters that God loves them and that God still cares despite the storm. Thank you so much for spending time with me. If you've enjoyed this and you'd like more video and audio resources to help you discover even more about God's amazing character, Check out all of the episodes available on our website, thebiblelab.com. You don't want to miss the conclusion to this series, episode eight, where we wrestle with the question, why is it 
that things seem to go from bad to worse so often. Is this caused by us, someone else, or even God? Or is this just simply Murphy's Law in motion? You don't want to miss it. We end with a bang. So I hope you'll come back and join us for the lively conclusion to our series, Acts of God, right here at the Bible Lab. This is Lifestyle Magazine. The guests on this show constantly amaze me and they inspire me, but they also inform me. That was the one thing that Debbie always said to me. She said, Ruta, you can ask for anything in this world from anybody providing it isn't for yourself. I always had this feeling that as long as I was making other people happy, it would make me happy. And you know what? It worked. And that's what I think sums it up with a lot of people that have CP is that it's not because they're stupid or not intelligent. They just, it's there. They just can't deliver it. And then I finally, well, I had a girlfriend that I loved so much. And at one point she told me, she said, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I said, you are. I said, well, don't be. Hi, I'm Mike Tucker. We'd like to invite you to watch a brand new season of Lifestyle Magazine. They had an argument that any, you know, 21 year old has. has. Yeah. yeah. He called up an old friend. He went out with him. They used drugs. The friend lived. David died. How do you think the message changes when a person with disabilities is involved in the creative process? I think it's a better understanding. We'll dive into some hot topics. I remember when he was little, I was like, oh, I hope he learns how to read. My character on General Hospital used to wear these black leather pants, and that seemed to get a lot of fan reaction. <laughs> Sometimes informational. But I, I asked, what happens when you disagree? How do you resolve the conflict? And you said? It's my fault. There are more fatalities through drowsy driving than medicated or drunk driving combined. When I really realize how that role impacted women, yes, it and makes me important. feel very, very good. Sometimes a little controversial. You don't have to be sick anymore. All you have to do is change what you eat. I, I didn't have a backup plan. Thank goodness it worked because I had no backup plan. But always relevant to your life. And this is? This is Zeus. He's a four-year-old Belgian Malinois. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> be sure to join us for a new season of Lifestyle Magazine.